everyone. You may be wondering what I'm doing. Well, if you remember last week, we started answering letters from kids like you about different things on their mind. And this month, we're answering questions that deal with contentment. Do you remember what contentment means? Let's review. Contentment is deciding to be happy with what you've got. Right now, I'm answering a letter from a young lady named Sarah. And Sarah writes, Dear Tenrico, we just moved to a new island. The house is nice. The beach is not far away and I have my own room. But all my friends live in New Providence and my soccer team is there too. I know my mom worked hard to get us here. But I really wish I could go back to Nassau. What should I do? Sign, longing for home. Sounds like Sarah has a real problem. She is only seeing what she no longer has. The Bible says in Philippians 4 verse 12 b, I have learned the secret of being content no matter what happens. I am content whether I am well fed or hungry. I am content whether I have more than enough or not enough. Why don't we go into our lessons and see how we can help Sarah? As always, today's lessons are focused on our kids electric students in grades one through six and our Harvest Adventures in preschool. Make sure you pay close attention to what's happening so you don't miss out on any of our amazing stories or the super cool fun happening in Kids in Action. Why don't you check out Kids in Action and I'll see you when you get back. Welcome back to Kids in Action, where every experiment sparks excitement and every object lesson brings the Bible to life. It's time to unleash the power of faith in action with Kids in Action. Hey everyone, my name is Tika and I am here with my amazing assistant, Brian. All month long, we are talking about contentment. Brian, wanna tell everyone what our definition of contentment is? Contentment is deciding to be happy with what you have. So what do you think the opposite of contentment is? Mm, not being happy with what you have. That's a good answer. But the word I was looking for was complaining. Complaining? That sounds like something most kids are good at. Not only kids, Brian. Many adults complain too. It comes naturally with our sinful nature. We tend to think about ourselves, what we want, what we can't get, and the things we longed for in the past. We start grumbling and complaining, and that's not fun for anyone. But it is hard not to grumble or complain when I don't have some of the things that I used to have. I agree, but when we grumble and complain, you miss out on what you have now. That's what we'll find out about in our Bible story today when we talk about the Israelites. Those are a bunch of complainers. Let's demonstrate with today's object lesson called complaining balloons. Complaining balloons? Mm-hmm. All we need are some balloons, a few hex nuts, and some nickels. So, Brian, tell me what's the difference between the edge of the nickel and the edge of that hex nut. Well, the nickel has a more smooth edge, while the hexes have a more sharpened, rough edge. That's right. Let's put this smooth edge nickel into the balloon and blow it up and see what happens. Hmm. Okay. Okay, now, wow. Okay, I'm not hearing much complaining in there. That's right, no 
complaining going on in here? And if the Israelites didn't complain about what they used to have, but no longer had, they would have moved smoothly through life. They probably would not have spent 40 years wandering around in a desert either. Now, let's try the same thing with a hex nut. Ready? So we're gonna take hex nut and we're gonna fit it inside here. And now can you blow that up for me? Well, it sounds like a whole lot of complaining to me. In fact, we can say it's a complaining nut, right? What do you think will happen if I just keep spinning this? I'm too afraid to find out. Why is it going so fast? <laughs> you see, what happens when we spend almost all of our time complaining about what we don't have, we can actually cause so much damage to our own lives and the lives of those around us. So I'm gonna just keep spinning this, but you guys can check out our Bible story and see what's gonna happen next. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. We're kicking things off today from the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. Our story is from chapter 16. Back in the day, God's people had it a bit rough, working hard, being slaves, making bricks and building pyramids for the Egyptians. But it wasn't all that bad, I guess, because the Egyptians wanted their slaves to be strong. So they made sure the Israelites had plenty of food. Now, I can imagine that they were still pretty miserable since they had absolutely no freedom to do anything. God's people cried out for help and God led them to safety through Moses. Moses, with God's help, even parted the Red Sea to help them escape. But they ended up in the desert. Yep, there was nothing. Just hot sun, no food, no water, and seemingly nowhere to go. The Israelites started to complain. What are we going to eat? Who's in charge out here anyway? Well, Moses and his brother Aaron were in charge and the Israelites started to complain to them. They even said things like, at least when we were back in Egypt, we had food given to us. Their complaints were so bad that they even started saying that they wished, instead of being free, that they had died back in Egypt as slaves. Now, can you imagine being that ungrateful? God had kept the Israelites safe from Pharaoh's entire army when he rescued them in Egypt, yet they didn't even trust God now to give them what they needed. God spoke to Moses and he told Moses and his brother Aaron to gather the people together. And here is what Aaron said to them in Exodus chapter 16, verse 9. Come to the Lord. He has heard you speak against him. As Aaron spoke to the people, the glory of the Lord appeared in the desert, hovering like a cloud. The people were amazed. Moses told them that God said, When the sun goes down, you will eat meat. In the morning, you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. Well, the people saw that the sun was going down right then. And wouldn't you know, birds! God sent quail for the Israelites to eat. It was more than enough for them to fill their bellies, all the meat they could eat. And in the morning, they were promised bread. And that's what they got. Thin white flakes on the ground, looking like frost tasted amazingly like bread. It was all over the ground. Each morning, the bread, called manna, appeared again, and every evening, the quail returned. The Israelites were no longer hungry. However, the Israelites found something to complain about again. This time, they were thirsty. I'm so thirsty, I'm about to pass out, they whined. Moses told them again to gather around. Moses was getting frustrated. In Exodus 17 verse 2, he says, Why are you arguing with me? Why are you testing the Lord? The Israelites kept up their complaining. Why did you bring us out here to the desert? Was it just to watch us all die of thirst? 
Instead of remembering all that God had given them and how he promised to take care of them, the people got so upset that they were ready to take it out on Moses. So Moses cried out to God, what am I going to do with these people? They are almost ready to kill me by throwing stones at me. Well, God answered Moses. He told him to get out in front of the people. Then he said, take in your hand the walking stick you used when you struck the Nile River. Go, I will stand there in front of you by the rock at Mount Horeb. Hit the rock. Moses did as God instructed. Once he hit the rock, water poured out. God had continually given the Israelites what they needed as they needed it. But they were so focused on what they had in Egypt, what was in the past, that they kept missing out on what God was providing now. See, being content means deciding to be happy with what you've got. The Israelites sure weren't happy even though God gave them the food every day and water every day in a desert. I suppose people will always find something to complain about, but God doesn't want us to be whiners and complainers. He wants us to be content. Speaking of that, let's look at the one thing that I want you to remember today. When you focus on what you used to have, you can miss out on what you have now. Think about all the amazing things that you have in this moment. Friends, family, a great church, a great school, even a wonderful person who loves to tell you stories on Sunday mornings. God provides for you every day. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for showing us how to be content here and now through the story of the Israelites in the desert. Please help us to find ways to see your provision, your help, your hand in all that we do and that we don't lose sight of what you're doing by focusing too much on what we used to have or how things used to be. Our lives are yours here and now. Thank you for providing for us every day. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome to another exciting time where we learn about God's word. This month, we are learning about contentment. What a big word. Can you say that word with me? On the count of three, let's say it together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Contentment. Great job. Now, contentment is deciding to be happy with what you've got. Our story today is about Moses and the Israelites. Are you ready to hear the story? Great. Our story today is found in the Bible and everything we read in the Bible is true. The Israelites traveled for many days and they were tired and hungry. They complained to Moses, there's nothing to eat in the desert. At least we had food in Egypt. Now we're starving. God heard them and that evening, God sent birds called quail for the Israelites to eat. The next morning, God sent bread from heaven. It was called manna and it tasted like honey. The Israelites found manna on the ground, but they complained again. Now they said, we're thirsty. Moses asked God what to do. God told Moses to hit the rock with his staff. When Moses hit it, cold, fresh water gushed for everyone to drink while they were in the desert. Israelites would not go hungry and thirsty again. When you focus on what you used to have, you can miss what you have now. That sounds like what the Israelites said in our story today. They were thinking about what they had in Egypt and almost missed all the blessings that God was giving to them. Let's remember our word of the month, contentment, deciding to be happy with what you've got. Now it's time to pray. Let's close our eyes and talk to God together. Dear God, you are such an awesome God. You provide for us in every situation. Thank you for always providing for us. Help us to be happy with what we have and to be thankful for all that you do for us. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. It's memory verse time. Yeah! I have learned the secret of being content. No matter what, Philippians 4 verse 12. I have learned the secret of being
being content no matter what. Philippians 4 verse 12. Sometimes it's hard to wait for all the things that I want. Sometimes I kind of feel like it's just taking too long. trust that you're working it out i'm gonna hold up slow down i'm gonna trust that you're working it out God provides for us every day. And if we dwell too much on what we used to have, we miss how God is working for us right now. You might say, I used to have great friends, but since I moved, I'm lonely. Or, I used to have a great bike, but now it's old and broken. Or, I used to have the newest phone, but now another new phone is out and I want that one instead even though nothing is wrong with the one that you have now. You don't realize that though you might not have the same friends as you did in your old school, God is even now providing you with awesome new friends here, right now. And maybe you've outgrown your old bike, but I bet you've gotten some awesome things since then that are even more fun. And even though you may not have the newest phone on the market, the one you have is still a great one and serves its purpose. All of this reminds me of what Paul says in our memory verse for this month. Let's all read it together. I have learned the secret of being content no matter what happens. I am content whether I am well fed or hungry. I am content whether I have more than enough or not enough. Philippians 4 verse 12b. So, when you start complaining about all the things that you used to have, remember that God is faithful and He provides for you. Every single need that you have, He is meeting. You can't reach out and take hold of what God has for you now if you are holding tightly on what you used to have. Our bottom line today says when you focus on what you used to have, you can miss what you have now. Say that with me. When you focus on what you used to have, you can miss what you have now. So as you go throughout this week, every time you start to complain about what you don't have, I want you to stand in front of the mirror and say, thank you. 
to God for giving you breath in your body, food to eat, clothes to wear, shoes on your feet, and the fact that he woke you up in your right mind. That alone will help you be content no matter what. Hey guys, welcome back. Did you enjoy the story today? The Israelites were so focused on their life in Egypt, they forgot to be content with what God was providing for them in the desert. They forgot about the manna, they forgot about the water, and they forgot about the quail. See, Sarah, just like the Israelites, when you focus on what you used to have, you miss what you have now. Take some time to explore the new island and introduce yourself to the kids there. Who knows, you may discover just how great your new home really is. Well, it's time to say goodbye again. It is our hope that this week's message has encouraged you to focus on what you have instead of what you had. Thanks for hanging out with us, and we'll see you next week as we continue our discussion on contentment right here on Harvest Kids TV, our Family Life TV experiences at Bahamas Harvest Church. And remember kids, when you focus on what you used to have, you miss what you have now. Have a great week, guys. Parents, have you ever felt like it is just too much to deal with your children? So you look for anyone that will lend a hand? Maybe that overwhelming fear and exhaustion has a deathly grip on your heart and your lungs feel like they will collapse inside your chest because of all the responsibilities that come along with parenting? Maybe you have some people in your circle who you thought could and would lend a hand to be at the village and help you raise your children, but they are the ones sucking the life, morals, and godly principles out of you. Maybe you are experiencing manipulation and control from the very persons God and others warned you about. Red flags all over the place, but you thought it was a carnival and chose to allow them into your life because you just needed help with this parenting thing. Maybe you are at your wit's end and now see that the more you try to toss the murky water from those toxic relationships that is causing your boat to sink, the more they are poking holes in it. Listen to me. Don't lose hope. It's not too late to make a change. Through strategic prayer, God can weed out those in your life who need to go and bring into your life those persons that will bring healing, restoration and joy for god to do his part though you need to be willing to do your part set proper boundaries in your life and get to pruning and weeding so that you may foster a village of beautiful people who will speak your same language to your children that will cause them and you to flourish denise lithis once said like arsenic toxic people will slowly kill you they kill your positive spirit and play with your mind and emotions. The only cure is to let them go. So I challenge you today, parents, don't turn a blind eye to the alarming facts. Don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. Allow your past to be your ally in the process of repairing your present. This will ensure you have a better future with and for your children. Hello everyone, I'm Jason and we are excited to welcome you to our Crossover TV Teen segment, which is geared toward our high school students in grades 7 through 12. Here on Crossover TV, we talk about the things that concern you. Today, we continue our series on Limitless. Life is full of decisions. Some decisions are pretty simple, like where are we going to eat lunch? Which pair of socks are we going to wear? And what movie will we see this weekend? Other decisions are life altering. Stay tuned. We on the move, we on the rise, crossing over every track. We gon' rise, we gon' rise, we gon' rise, we gon' rise, 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 It's 
me again, Jason. With all the decisions we make each day, inevitably, there will be mistakes. Whether through purposeful sin or unintentional error, we all made decisions in which we choose differently. The bad decisions we make have consequences. As humans, we can't be perfect. But the good news is that we follow a perfect God. And when we keep our eyes on Him, that's when we win. Today's bottom line, or takeaway from our discussion is, don't bury what God can build on. Let's tune into our communicator as she explains how God doesn't define us by our behavior. Let's check it out. What's the first word that comes to mind when you hear the name LeBron James? What about when you hear the name Adele? Now, it's true that Adele and LeBron James probably wouldn't have much in common if they hung out on a Friday night, but they do share one similarity. They're both known for something. LeBron James, of course, is one of the most famous basketball players of all time. When people hear his name, they immediately think basketball. And everyone knows Adele is one of the greatest singers of our generation. We could throw some other names out there too. Steve Jobs, Selena Gomez, Peyton Manning. These people all have one thing in common. They're all known for what they've done. And while most famous people are known for great things, sometimes they're known for not so great things. You can probably think of a few celebrities just this week alone who've gone viral for something they've said or something they did. But this isn't just true for celebrities. In your family, your school, even in this church, there are people known for the things they've done. Like the teacher that's known for letting you out of class 10 minutes early every Friday. Or the friend that's known for lending you her phone charger because you forgot yours again. But the people around us aren't always known for great things either. Sometimes people are known for the ways they've messed up. Sometimes they're even defined by those things. You know what I'm talking about. It's the stuff most people think about when they think or see that guy at your school that's defined by the fight he got into with a classmate last year. Or the girl that's defined by what she did with her boyfriend at a huge party on the weekend. Or the sibling that's defined by what your parents found on their phone or in their room. Have you ever been there? Ever felt defined by something you've done? Like that thing is following you around and hanging over your head. And even if it's something that's never gotten out, the truth is we've all made choices that could define us. Maybe for you, it's a decision you made like gossiping about your best friend, or shoplifting at the mall, or cheating on your final exam, or sleeping with your girlfriend. Or maybe it's a habit you still can't shake, like smoking, or, or vaping, or cursing, or pornography, or cutting. I mean, just the thought of someone finding out about something like this is enough to keep you up at night. That's why we work so hard to bury these things and make sure no one ever finds out. Because there's nothing worse than being defined by something you're not proud of. It's that crawl under a rock until you're 35 feeling. Thankfully, we're not the first people to feel defined or limited by what we've done. In fact, the story we're going to look at today sums up this feeling perfectly. Remember Moses from last week? The Hebrew kid who became an Egyptian prince? Yeah, that Moses. He was supposed to be killed as a baby, but the Pharaoh's daughter rescued him. Well, even with that kind of good fortune, Moses still had one of those crawl under a rock moments. One of those, if anyone finds out about this, I'll never live it down situation. Here's what happened in Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Well, that escalated quickly. 
If you thought you had anger issues, Moses just one upped you. And at first glance, it sounds like Moses didn't think anything of the murder. He went out, killed the guy, went about his way. But if we look a little closer, I don't think Moses was as sure of himself as he seems. Before Moses killed the Egyptian guy, the verse says he looked in all directions to make sure no one was watching. Now, I don't know about you, but the only time I make sure no one is watching is when I'm doing something I kind of already know I shouldn't. And that's exactly where Moses found himself. Looking over his shoulder, covering his tracks, burying the body. And if someone, anyone found out, it would really be bad news for Moses. And fortunately for Moses, that's exactly what happens next. The story continues in verses 13 and 14. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and our judge? Are you gonna kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking everyone knows what I did. Isn't that everyone's worst nightmare? First, Moses kills a guy and buries the body, hoping no one finds out. Then after what was probably a sleepless night for him, the next day someone comes up to him and asks sarcastically, aren't you gonna kill me like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Talk about immediate panic. Imagine what Moses was thinking in this moment. How did this guy find out what I did? Who told him? Who else knows? And worst of all, does Pharaoh know? And if you didn't think it couldn't get any worse for Moses, guess what? It does. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard. And he tried to have Moses killed. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. For Moses, this was game over. He blew it and he knew it. He would forever be known as a murderer, forever be defined by what he did, forever be limited by his mistake. Talk about feeling embarrassed, judged, and hopeless. So Moses did what we all want to do when we feel embarrassed, judged, and hopeless. He left town. Moses did the equivalent of crawling under a rock, packing up, and moving to a place far away from his home. But something happens after Moses gets to Midian. After he settles in and starts his new life as a criminal on the run, God shows up. And I don't just mean symbolically. God literally shows up and get this, starts a conversation with Moses, the murderer. Let that sink in for a minute. Try to imagine what God might say to a man who just killed someone, hid the body and hit the road. You might think he'd say, I see everything or you can't outrun me. But God doesn't. He doesn't say any of those things. Listen to what God says instead in Exodus chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. Now, not what you'd expect, right? Definitely not what Moses would have expected. God is asking Moses to do something for him. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never asked a murderer to do me a favor. You know, call me crazy, but it's never seemed like a good idea. But apparently, it did to God. And the funny thing is, God doesn't even mention the murder. He just appears to Moses and basically says, hey, I need to use you, let's go. <laughs> Now, there's no doubt God knew what Moses did. I mean, everyone knew what Moses did. And there's no doubt how God felt about it. He's not a big fan of the murder your enemy approached to life. But it didn't keep him from using Moses to do something important. Think about this. Being a murderer defined Moses, at least for most people around him, but not for God. And this reality is true for you too. God doesn't see your sin or your mistakes as your definition either. Look, we've all made those I hope no one ever finds out decisions. We've all battled those I hope no one ever finds out habits. 
And while those decisions and habits may have consequences, here's what I want you to know. God doesn't think of that when he thinks of you. When you make a mistake, he doesn't cross you off his list or decide he can't use you in his plan. You may feel like your mistake or habit is the end of your story, but he doesn't. To him, your potential is still limitless. On his own, Moses felt exposed, defined, and limited by his sin. But when he ran to God, everything changed. Despite his sin and before Moses even had a chance to redeem himself, God shows up and basically says, I can work with this. I can use this guy. So what does that mean for us? Well, here's what I think we can take away from this. Don't bury what God can build on. Don't hide, cover up, or run away from what God can use. The reality is there is no mistake and no sin that God can't build on. He can make you part of his plan no matter what you've done. And so, if God can build on anything, what's the point of continuing to hide our mistakes? What's the point of burying the decisions that nag at us? Look, you don't move past your mistakes by hiding them day after day. You move past your mistakes by bringing them into the light. So don't bury what God can build on in your life. So, what mistake have you been burying? What decision is limiting what or who you think you can be? Maybe you've been having a bad decision at a party last semester, or having an internet addiction, or bearing a relationship filled with regret, or bearing the hurtful things you said about someone. No matter what it is for you, if you're ready to move past it, there are two steps you can take. First, ask God to help you see yourself the way he sees you, with potential. This is huge because sometimes it feels like everyone is defining you by your past, that you're a screw up. And even if no one else does, you see yourself as a screw up. But God doesn't see you that way. God sees someone he can use and that's important to realize. Next, bring your bad decision to light. Instead of burying it, you need to tell someone about it. I know this part sounds crazy, but trust me, the only thing harder than talking about your mistake with someone is trying to keep it to yourself. Things kept in the dark grow. They become more powerful. But the opposite is also true. When you bring that decision to light, when you talk about it, that decision loses some of its power. So find an adult, a guidance counselor, your youth pastor, a parent, or someone you can trust with this part of yourself. The awesome part is, you are surrounded by people who love you and are there for you. In fact, some of those people are around you right now. Share with them so they can rally around you, support you, and remind you that your future is not limited by your mistakes. So remember, don't bury what God can build on. Don't hide what doesn't need to be hidden any longer because God can use you just the way you are. He's not limited by your mistakes. He's not waiting for you to be a perfect friend, a perfect student, a perfect sibling, or a perfect son or daughter before he uses you. He can use you today. So, as you go through this week, I want you to ask yourself this question. What am I most tempted to bury in my life? What decision, problem, or mistake feels like it could define me if anyone found out? Bringing that decision to light won't be easy, but I promise you, it will be worth it. And there is nobody like our God. I want you to tell someone right now that our God will never lie. He's a man of his word. Tell somebody right now. If you're on WhatsApp, right now just WhatsApp a friend and tell them that God is a God, a man of his word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We give God all the glory today. We give him all the praise. Listen, yeah, all things are possible when you believe all chains are breakable. 
when you receive Yahweh, you keep your promises. You said it, we believe it. If you said it, we believe it. Hey, I want you to rock with us a little bit. If you said it, we believe it. Hey guys, Carlson here. In today's communication, we learned that God doesn't define us by our behavior. The bad decisions we make have consequences. When we wrong someone or make a mistake, it's important we do what we can to make it right. But in Philippians, we see an encouragement to not dwell in the past, but to keep moving forward. As humans, we can't be perfect. But the good news is that we follow a perfect God and when we keep our eyes on Him, that's when we win. When we live in the past, it limits what God can do with our future. Bearing this in mind, I have a few questions for you. Question number one. What are some lies that people believe about their future because of something they've done in the past? I know I believed that because of things I've done in the past that I could not be good enough to help others, but it's quite the opposite. The things I went through, whether I quit or failed, my experiences can be a blessing to others by helping others to overcome what they may be going through. Question number two, what are the benefits bringing to the light the mistakes we're tempted to hide? By doing this, you can provide direction to others on the way out. It is said that experience is the best teacher, but it never said that it must be your experience. We all can learn from the experiences of others. Question number three, why is it important who we confess to? What are some characteristics to look for in a person we can confess to? When I need to confess something, I look for someone who is living the life I would like to live. Someone who is not only honest, but they are trustworthy. A person that is kind and intelligent and that has integrity. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the gifts, skills, and talents that you have placed within us. Help to increase those things to be of help to others. And please fill us with the boldness and confidence that we could be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it for this week, but remember, don't bury what God can build on. Today, our communicator spoke about how we've all done things and made choices that define us in the eyes of others. And while it's nice to be defined by the good things we've done, we'd all probably agree that being known for a choice we're not proud of has a way of limiting us. We learned that Moses made a choice like that. A choice so bad, he tried to run from it, hide from it, bury it away. But the good news is that while others tried to define Moses by his bad decision, God didn't. In fact, God still wanted to use Moses in a huge way. Knowing this truth, here are some helpful tips for you to consider. First tip, call it by name. Write down the mistake you've made that you tried to hide and bury. Call those mistakes aloud and take ownership of them. Then. Surrender them to God by confessing them to him. Then ask God, how? How can he help build on those mistakes to help others? And second, move forward. Don't get stuck in the past. When we live in the past, it limits what God can do with our future. Think about it. What's a what if you ask about your past that you can trust God with today? Well, it's time to say goodbye. It was a pleasure hanging out with you today. We hope this lesson has been helpful to you as you navigate life's challenges. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, don't bury what God can build on. It was our absolute pleasure hanging out with you today. Continue to keep safe. And we'll see you right here next week on Crossover TV. 
And don't forget today's bottom line. Don't bury what God can build on. Have an amazing week. Sure to be greeted by bright, friendly faces as you go to the sanctuary for your service of choice. Children are escorted by their parents to our age-appropriate environments, which include Harvest Adventurers, that's for our nursery, toddlers, and kindergarten, Kids Electric for our grades one through six, and our crossover junior environment for teenagers grades seven to nine, and crossover seniors, which is designed for our teenagers of grades 10 to 12. Now, in each of these environments, your children learn at their grade level, allowing them a far better appreciation for Jesus and who he is to them. We guarantee that your child will not only enjoy themselves, but are sure to nag you for a replay the following week. If you're enjoying the program, we wish to remind you that you have another chance to catch up with Pastor Mario at our one and only location now on JFK on Sunday mornings. Find out what makes Bahamas Harvest Church so different. From the moment you walk through our doors, you will find smiling faces, and an atmosphere that will draw you in. There are age-appropriate environments for your children from nursery through grade 12, so you can focus on the word without distraction. Anointed praise and worship, and a word from Pastor Mario that is timely, down to earth, and actionable for transformative life change. Our service times are now 8 a.m., 10 a.m. and 12 noon only. And we hope to see you there. And remember, we're only on JFK now. Bahamas Harvest Church, reaping the end time harvest in the Bahamas and beyond.